frozen to the bone There's darkness in your soul Oh God help me. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Venom Vlog and we are here for part three of our dark web discussion. And today we're gonna to be talking about five more issues from the dark web crossover. We're gonna dive into Amazing Spider-Man 16 and 17, Gold Goblin number three, Venom number 15, and Black Cat and Mary Jane or Mary Jane and Black Cat issue three. This is where I really start hating this book and this series. Um, you know, they still do a good job of, okay, this character disappeared. So they're not in these two issues because they're in limbo, but now they're back. So we're going to have a scene where they show back up again. Like they do a pretty good job of that kind of stuff, which is things I've always criticized the, the Venom books for doing during crossovers is how bad their continuity is. I will say the editors are putting in an effort here to make sure that if something happens in one book, it's mentioned in another book. So that is a positive I want to get out of the way because for me, it's really the only positive next to artwork. I think a lot of these books have really great artists on them but i think some of the writing is just really subpar the dialogue is really bad um, some of the events that happen are just really cheesy some of them a little redundant and it just it feels like such a waste of time and, and sometimes it feels like characters forget that they're in a giant apocalyptic battle and so all these convenient things happen uh, where they can get away with just doing normal people stuff or they force it and it just doesn't feel right. So we'll get into that because a lot of that happens in Gold Goblin number three, where I feel like Cantwell, if they would have just given him a five issue Gold Goblin miniseries that had nothing to do with Dark Web, I think that would have been better. <laughs> Honestly, I think that would have. We'll get into all that, but I want to start here where we get into Amazing Spider-Man number 16. Uh, this is by Zeb Wells and Ed McGinnis, and I like Ed McGinnis's artwork, and I like Zeb Wells' writing typically, but I gotta say this Spider-Man run of his has just not been doing it for me. Um, it has moments like in the beginning, I was like, okay, the first six issues with Tombstone and, you know, Peter's old friend, his roommate and stuff. I'm like, okay, th there's parts in here that I like. And then they got Dr. Octopus in there and, you know, they brought in more characters. They had Black Cat come in. I'm like, okay, there's a couple little things in here I'm liking, but it's getting less and less. And now by the point we get to this crossover, these Spider-Man issues to me are just terrible. You know, it's great that Ed McGinnis is drawing them. So they look good, at least in my opinion, but man, is it bad. Cause like we have this scene here at the beginning where Ben is explaining to Peter you know what the issue is he's like hey man don't you remember i gave you a device a helmet it's supposed to give me back my memories all you had to do was put it on and then you said some cheesy dialogue and smashed it and then kicked me off of a you know a, a ledge 300 style into some radioactive goo and that's how i became chasm and peter's like that's not how that happened at all dude he's like we you sacrificed yourself you did a, a heroic thing because you knew that helmet would would take away my memories and it would and would cause pain to all of us. And you said, no, I'm going to take the brunt of this attack and I'm going to dive into this liquid and, you know, sacrifice myself so that everybody can go home happy, hopefully. And except for Janine, you know, who mourned his loss for until she found him, obviously. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Peter's like, this isn't how it happened at all, dude. Like you're you're misremembering everything and that's not cool. And it's very, you know, lame because it feels like such a generic writing trope cliche where ben is so dead set and so positive that something happened a certain way yet he's constantly complaining that his memories aren't intact and it's like do you hear your like the lack of self-awareness from this guy he's like you took all my memories my memories are all jumbled up and then peter's like okay then how do you know that i smashed that machine and kicked you into the the water or the goo like how do you you know why are you so determined that you know that for a fact and he's like I don't know, I just do. And then, you know, it's like when he met Venom, he's like, I feel like I know you. And when he met Norman, he's like, I know who you are. You killed me. I'm like, so the memory thing is so inconsistent. It's so wildly, you know, represented in different ways uh, to the extremes per book. And that's probably one of the biggest issues because then it, it gets harder and harder to try to appreciate what they're, the story they're trying to tell with Ben. Ben, I think, has a loyal fan base. There are people out there who don't give a crap about Ben Riley, I'm sure. And it might, they might even be the majority, but there is a lot of people out there that really like Ben and really you know, know that he was as heroic, if not more so, than Peter during the Clone Saga. I mean, they gave Ben a lot of great moments and he became, I thought, a very awesome Spider-Man. Um, and so with this, it's like when you see him fall from grace, like when they, you know, Dan Slott made him the Jackal, 
you're like, ah, I don't like this. But they kind of try to explain it by saying he was killed and brought back, a, a, you know, a number of times. And and his mind is kind of warped at this point, you know. So, okay, great. But then in Spider-Geddon, he went back to factory settings, which meant to us, he went back to the Ben from the 90s. And that was shown in Beyond when he showed up to Peter and said, hey, man, I'm I'm Ben. It's me. And I want to talk this out with you. I don't want to just take over the mantle of Spider-Man. I want your blessing. And with you being injured, I really, I still don't want to do it unless I have your blessing. I could totally keep doing it, but unless you tell me I can, I don't want to. And it's like, that feels like a Ben Riley thing. This doesn't. And because the inconsistencies of his memories from book to book and by scenario to scenario, it's like, all right, we need him to remember this because it, it pushes the story in this direction. But we don't need him to remember this because then it'll, it'll, prevent the story from going in a direction that would have a, a, a happy ending or a, a nice conclusion. And it just, all that's very forced and it's very bad. So like Zeb Wells and some of these writers, I just like, I'm sure you did your best, but this story is an absolute mess. And these characters are an absolute mess. And you guys ruined Ben Riley in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, he was a cool character. I'm not going to lose sleep. My childhood's not, you know, destroyed. I'm not one of those types of people where it's like the end of the world. But it's like this character had so much potential, and uh, and especially when you brought him back, I'm like, since you brought him back, you've made me dislike him so much most of the time that I wish you didn't bring him back. I wish you would have just told stories of Cain instead. Um, but hey, whatever, and, you know, that's Marvel for you. So this whole book is just Spider-Man fighting Chasm. That's really what it is. I, I can't really spoil much in here because that's what's happening. Uh, we do get a scene with Venom in this book, though. This happens right before um, you know Venom 14, where uh, you know, All Hallows Eve and uh, Madeline Pryor have Venom join the fight. So they kind of, she turns into a Frankenstein and kind of kicks him into the battle. And that's where he goes and fights Sink and everything like that in the in the Venom book, um, where he's trying to take down the treehouse. And then Al Hallows Eve is waiting, uh, you know, on, on standby to go in and take that device for Madeline. But this just happens to take place right around the beginning of Venom 14 at the same time. So anyway, but yeah, that's the whole fight. It's just them battling. And then this device that Ben has that he casts a spell with, he shows Peter that he sent a bunch of his friends like J. Jonah Jameson and Joe Robbie Robertson. He sent them down to limbo. And that if Peter wants them, he has to willingly go down to limbo to get them. So Peter agrees and he gets brought down to limbo and he gets put in a nightmare scenario, which we're gonna talk about here in a second when we get to the next issue where he basically has to reenact his life, but with demons playing all the parts of the people in his life. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. Um, so let's skip over to Gold Goblin because I actually like Christopher Cantwell. I like his writing. Lan Medina, who does the artwork, does a good job in this one. Um, and it has Norman kind of reeling from the revelation in the last issue where he found out that Dr. Ashley Kafka actually has all of his sins put into her. And I did make a mistake. I thought that her sins or that the sins of Norman that was taken by Sin Eater, I thought they went back into Norman because of this limbo demon, you know, event that's happening. Um, but apparently the Beyond Corporation are the ones who actually summoned those sins somehow from hell and put them into Ashley Kafka. So my mistake on that one, I just thought it all tied into the dark web event, but I did have a question. I was like, how, how is the, you know, how are spirits from hell, you know, uh, invading earth when limbo's invading earth and i found my answer i did a little research and i was like oh right that happened during the beyond storyline so anyway so ashley kafka as queen goblin is out there and norman's like i need to go find her and it's going to be hard to find her during all this chaos but i need to go look for her and find her and so he suits up and he goes out and uh, that's when he comes across some kids they're in a fire and he decides you know what i'm going to abandon the queen goblin thing and actually save people and try to do things different, kind of be an anti-Norman Osborn in this scenario. And he does, and he saves these people, saves these kids, and he does something heroic. And then he decides to go back home and spend time with Liz and his family at Alchemex, like his grandson Normie, and he and they're throwing Normie a birthday party. Even though demons have invaded New York and inanimate objects are coming to life, but apparently there's no inanimate objects coming to life in this building of Alchemex. So very convenient, right? And so they're like, okay, let's just have Normie have his birthday party because screw it, you know, monsters and stuff infect New York all the time. So we're just going to continue on like we're having a normal day. And it's like, ah, really? Like, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. Um, so I guess they provided protection for all these kids and their parents. And then they hired a Spider-Man impersonator to show up at the party 
just, I don't know, there's some lame stuff in this book. And the thing that sucks is that I like Christopher Cantwell. I like his writing, but man, oh man, is this just, you know, every time you get two or three good pages, you get like four bad ones because of this dark web event. But then it kind of focuses in at the end, which I'm really happy it did, where you have Jack O'Lantern show up and he attacks Norman Osborn and, uh, you know, at Alchemex and thus ruining Normie's birthday and, you know, possibly putting everyone in danger. And Norman is like, no freaking way. He's like, you're not going to come after my grandson. So he suits up and he beats the living crap out of Jack-O-Lantern, you know, who was out for revenge on him, um, for calling him a loser and blowing up half his face. But then Norman, you know, he gets a chance. He's going to kill uh, Jack-O-Lantern and then he decides not to. And he brings him to the roof of Alchemex and says, look, talk to me. You know, I don't want to do the Norman Osborn thing. You're right. I am a murderer. I've killed people in the past. I'm trying to be better. So tell me your name. Is Please tell me it's not Jack. And he's like, no, my name is Owen. I, you know, used to be a, a student. And then I really looked up to you. You were a businessman, but I was kind of invisible to a lot of people. And then one day, you know, as being a med student, I got caught up with some of the wrong people. I learned some of the, you know, the dark sides of, you know, trading drugs and stuff in New York and getting some, you know, um, illegal st substances out to people and, and how it's traded in the underground in New York. And he's like, and I kind of got involved with that. And then that led me to a facility of yours where I found some of this gear and I modified some of it and became the new jack-o'-lantern. And he's like, so Norman's like, fine, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I blew up half your face. You know, you attacked and, you know, how can we make this right? And, you know, they shake hands. Normie comes in and he's like, hey, um, you know, and, and jack lantern's like, sorry, I ruined your birthday, kid. And Normie's like, yeah, it's fine. He's like, it's, it happens a lot around here. Um, and he's like, but that's cool. So Jack, this Jack Lantern at least looks like he might go off to do better things. Maybe we'll see uh, where, where Owen's life takes him from here on out. But I just thought that was a cool moment. I'm like, all right, that's neat. You know, it's, it's, it's Norman really trying, you know, trying to do the best and, and defeat his demons and, and rise above. So I like that, but still having it set during this whole crossover was just like a little much. I feel like if you just took all the dark web stuff out of this issue and you just had this take place sometime after dark web, um, then it would have been fine. Uh, you know, or at least it would have come across better because it's just all convenient. It's just all too convenient when, oh, we want to throw a birthday party for a kid, but demons are attacking New York and they're inhabiting like fire hydrants and baby carriages and refrigerators and they're attacking people. And then some are just random demons with wings flying through the city. Like, but none of that's happening at this birthday party. And you're just like, like whatever. Okay. Jumping to Venom number 15, this is by Rom V and uh, Brian Hitch, and this book is basically just Venom versus Bedlam. Um, obviously, after Venom got kicked into battle and he fought against Sink, he got warped and changed around a little bit and started transforming into or evolving into Bedlam, which was supposed to be the next stage of him. If you're reading the, the current Venom book, he's supposed to keep evolving until he becomes Meridius. So this is the next stage mm -hmm. that he's evolved into, and... His son, Dylan, has shown up to battle him. And last time they met, Dylan was basically stabbed in the chest and pretty much killed. But then Sleeper, you know, and a couple other people came together and, and saved him and uh, and put him back with the symbiote. And then Dylan went inside of the mind of the symbiote and found, like, the source of Venom and is now a new form of Venom, which we're going to see in this issue. So this was neat-ish, but I really am just not liking the current Venom book, to be honest with you. Uh, but this was okay. Like, I, I, as far as issues go in this story, this was all right. But mainly, just like the Spider-Man issue where he's fighting Chasm, this is just Dylan versus his dad as Bedlam, the entire issue. And you do get some flashbacks here. Um, you get Sleeper, who gets stabbed by the Necro Sword, or, you know, the sword that uh, Dylan has created. And it's, you know, cleansing him of the Hive, much like Dylan is. And then Dylan uses it to cleanse the Carnage symbiote, um, the sliver of it that he had in that jar that Normie was wearing for a while, and he cleansed it as well, which is weird because here he's got like a white anti-carnage suit with a red head and red hands, but as we know in the Red Goblin comic, he's purely red. So, I don't know, So someone didn't care for this design too much, I guess, <laughs> at one point. And it's not just them, like I said, they team up with Sleeper, and while they're out there looking for him, Miss Marvel has now returned to Earth, and her and Miles apparently have just saved that mosque and taken down those bird people. So she's going to show up at the end here and uh, and they're going to set that up for the next issue. So while Bedlam's fighting Venom, he actually transforms and becomes Codex, uh, which we've seen before. And so Dylan is taking on kind of his true form. 
Um, and then as as he's ready to kill Bedlam, because with his sword, he's like, this will this will kill you, Dad. He's like, we'll find a way to bring you back, but we're, I want to kill you so you don't evolve into Meridius. I want to stop his plans. And they even refer to Dylan as the chain breaker. So they're still playing with the theme that Donny Cates did with Ryan Stegman, where it's all about chains and Clintar means chains and you know all that stuff. So it looks like Dylan is the, the key to the lock. He's the chain breaker um, and he will somehow set everyone free because he can set each symbiote free. So he's a very useful weapon to have and hopefully he'll do that to Flash Thompson and some other characters coming up soon. And then the book ends with a big Miss Marvel splash page uh, because now she's going to join the fight. So yeah, um, uh, this issue was okay, but overall I just, this story is, it gets bad and, and we're going to dive into it some more. But first I want to talk about another fun book, which is Mary Jane and Black Cat number three. This is by Jed McKay and Vincenzo Caratu. Um, and again, Vincenzo, hopefully I'm saying your last name properly uh, because I mean no disrespect because your art is phenomenal. I think this book is a lot of fun. Jed McKay is quickly becoming one of my favorite writers at Marvel, has done a lot of fun stuff in the past, but now I hear he's going to be taking on the Avengers and being the new writer of Avengers. I might actually for the first time in a long time read Avengers monthly like get and get past like an issue or two. You know, I'm not a big Avengers guy. I'm more of an X-Men fan. But since X-Men is a series I don't really like right now, I'm excited to read Jed McKay's Avengers. And hopefully Moon Knight shows up at some point. Even if he doesn't join the team officially, I would just like to see him in the book. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, we have Black Cat, uh, Mary Jane and Black Cat number three. This picks up right where the last issue left off, where Sim is now, you know, in contact with the, the two girls. And he kind of laughs. He's like, oh, you know, Belasco sent you here too, right? And they're like, yeah, you know, so what? You know, like they try to hide it from him at first, but eventually they come clean. And they're like, yeah, okay, he sent us here. And he's like, all right, so what did he give you that gives you the edge? How did you get in this building? And she shows him the soul compass. And he's like, all right, fine. We'll use the soul compass. We'll work together. We'll get to the, the place we need to get to. We'll get his sword. And then we'll betray each other, right? And I kind of like that. Like, they're going through the tropes, but they're calling them out. So, like, Black Cat's like, all right, well, what's to stop you from betraying me right now? He's like, well, only you can use the, the soul, soul compass. So I'm going to need you to lead me to the sword. When we get to the sword, though, I, I promise I will betray you. And she's like, well, what if I betray you first? And Mary Jane's like, well, I might want to betray somebody or betray somebody. And it, it's kind of fun, the banter between everybody. Um, and then we also find out that Mary Jane, she uses her powers again and gets two skulls. And she believes now that Black Cat, her powers, the way they work, giving other people bad luck, might actually be giving her, Mary Jane, bad luck. And so now she's more afraid to use her powers around uh, Black Cat because it's increasing her chances of getting the three skulls. So in the last issue, she got one skull. This issue, she got two. And she's like, I don't want to use my powers anymore, but I also don't want to die in limbo. So, uh, so that is adding some stress to the situation. But the characters are fighting their way through this tower. They're working their way to the sword. And then, you know, Black Cat points out, like, where are the others? Like, where's Hydra? Where are the, the Heaven's Devils or, you know, whatever they are, like the flying creatures? Where? Why is it just you here, Sim? And he's like, ah, they're all outside waiting. They're expecting me to get the sword. And then when I come out, they're going to all try to kill me. And he's like, but they're not going <laughs> to. And he's like, because I'm going to have the sword. And I'm not giving it to Belasco. I'm going to use it to rule. He goes, because Belasco was actually human before he came here. And then after that, he gave the sword to Ileana, um, you know, magic, and she became the, the ruler. And then she gave the powers and ability to rule to Matt, uh, to Madeline Pryor. He's like, so I'm, I'm a demon from this realm. He's like, I'm tired of you humans coming in and ruling our world. He's like, so I'm taking this sword and I'm going to go rule and screw everybody else. And he goes, so when I have that sword, I'm going to mow them all down out there. And, uh, he's, and so she's like, okay, well, we need the sword because if we give it to Belasco, he'll send us home. And even Sim is kind of like, I'll send you home. Like, I don't care whether you stay here or not. He's like, if that's the deal. So I'm hoping that kind of comes to where they betray Belasco and, and give the sword to Sim and he sends them home. I think that would be pretty cool. So I don't know if that happens because in this book, the, the big cliffhanger at the end is that Mary Jane figures out that, uh, that there's something up with Black Cat, that she's withholding something. Um, because as you know, the demons are whispering and things are starting to come in, She's starting to see that there's some resentment or something being hidden uh, from Black Cat to Mary Jane. And Mary Jane's like, wait a minute, I've never wronged you. I don't know why you would be upset with me. And she goes, oh, you're not upset with me. And she goes, wait a minute, you're hiding something about Peter, aren't you? And that's where the book ends. So it looks like Mary Jane is is inching closer or probably right at the, the revelation 
that Black Cat actually has fallen in love with Peter Parker and is afraid to tell Mary Jane. So I, again, I just think this book is fun. Um, and if this was not involved with Dark Web, if this was just a book where Mary Jane and Black Cat got sent to limbo and had to do this to get out and it had nothing to do with Dark Web, I think I would still love it, but I might even like it a little bit more. Um, but I do like it a lot. I think Jay McKay is a very fun writer. He's very good with dialogue, I feel. Very good with like natural dialogue from characters because I feel like he really tries to tap in on who these characters are or at least try to get close to you know the versions of these characters that we've loved for many years. And, and I can respect that and I love that about his writing. So, uh, so yeah, so, you know, Mary Jane Black Cat number three, I'd say pick it up. Pick up that whole series. I'm going to go ahead and get issue four and five, and maybe we'll do, like, a follow-up uh, post-Dark Web where I talk about Gold Goblin four and five and Mary Jane and Black Cat four and five because clearly those books, you know, they're still going, um, and I want to know what happens to these characters uh, from those books, so we'll definitely discuss it on the show in a future episode, but we'll just wait till after Dark Web. All right, and last but not least, or very least actually, because I hate this book, uh, <laughs> this amazing Spider-Man number 17. Um, wow, man. Okay, Zeb Wells, Ed McGinnis, once again. Um, this book all takes place in limbo, and it's Peter Parker, and he has to kind of relive his life, reenact his life with everyone being portrayed by demons from limbo. So they're dressed up in you know, human clothes, they're tormenting Peter, they're saying, you know, they have J. Jonah Jameson following a script, yelling at him, saying, you know, get me pictures of Spider-Man, you know, and they're making Jonah play his role. They make Robbie play his role, kind of, but Robbie kind of disappears, like they show him hostage, and then he's like somewhere in the bugle working, but he's not around most of the time, and I think that's to conceal the Peter Parker secret identity thing from Robbie, um, so whatever, I don't know, <laughs> it's again, when when they want to do something for convenience, they just do it. You know, it's like, why didn't they just have Jonah captured? Why Robbie also, if you're going to ignore Robbie in this story? And just like, just stupid things like that, where you're just like, I, you wish someone said something to the writers, uh, to Zeb about this. Um, because I love Joe Robbie Robertson, but he doesn't add anything to this at all. Uh, so Peter is, you know, walking home from work, another crappy day. And Ben's like, hey, man, all you got to do is eat this apple. And that's the apple from a couple issues ago when they were the prequel to Dark Web where he's uh, revealing that they can use these fruits, these uh, forbidden fruits, to have um, you know someone eat them and it'll take their soul and then Ben can absorb that and get all of his memories back. So again, even if Ben wanted his memories back, which clearly he does in this story, the fact that he's willing to go to the length of completely destroying Spider-Man and Peter, it just shows you like how, just how this is not that character. I mean... You could have done a Spider Side. I know they used them recently in the, the Ben Riley miniseries, but they always mentioned the Spider Side 2.0. You could have introduced that character and said that he was Ben, you know, like this, he thought he was Ben or something, and then and Madeline twisted him and whatever. Like you could have done something, anything else. Like this, but this is just terrible. All this Ben stuff is just awful. And all this limbo stuff. I mean, even Madeline says it. She goes, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm making my own Insidious 6, which is a reference to the animated series, I believe. Um, but you have all these demon monsters that have decided to become the Sinister 6 or Insidious 6, and they've all been given powers, and a lot of them are dressed in human clothes. Like I said, there's a demon at the beginning, though, that I forgot to mention that Peter saved um, from getting beat up by a, another demon. So he now wants to be like Peter. So he's dressed as parker man or something like that um and ben's like no dude that's not how this goes like you're we don't need heroes i just need villains so like you're not a part of this i already made my insidious six like you're not a part of this and he's like give me powers i want to be like you know parker man and they're like no get out of here and madeline rightfully so is like this is such a waste of my powers my demons my minions my army like what are you trying to do here and it's just ben Ben needs Peter to willingly eat the apple. He can't force him to do it. And Peter even says, like, dude, I'm never going to eat that apple. He's like, you're never going to break me, dude. He's like, do you know nothing about me? Like, I get it that your memories are all screwed up, but, like, we don't give up. So, like, this is stupid, what you're trying to do. And I agree. I, this is And the fact that they're calling out in the story, though, doesn't make it better. Uh, it just makes me go, yeah. Like, it's one thing to reference something that you're doing. And, and like it'd be like a joke or like a funny bit or something like meta in the story. But when you when you are writing a bad story and then you say, hey, isn't this a bad story? It's like, yes, it is. Please stop writing it. Please stop cashing checks for doing this level of quality. Like it's 
it's this is bad stuff um and so jonah like his bed is like hey come lay down and you know this like monster's like brush your teeth and then use me to remove your teeth and there's just all these bad little bits in it and then peter finally comes up with a way to maybe outsmart these guys and get out of limbo and which you're like finally dude uh and then also um the, the little parker man guy who wants to be like peter he runs into that that giant creature thing that eddie met when he first got transported to limbo he met these two creatures in a lab that were working on a scientific experiment and they were studying his symbiote a little bit and that's where he like he came out of that symbiote well a sliver of it is still there and they just this creature that lived because remember one of them died the creature that lived decides all right i'm gonna use this little parker guy who he conveniently just runs into like again just convenience right everything is convenience in this story and he takes them and he combines them with a spider-man costume sliver that he found and the symbiote and then he's transforming so technically we got a new symbiote uh character that's about to pop up um, but here's the one time you see robbie in the book pretty much this scene and then the next scene when they escape but jonah outsmarts the demons they all leave it, it, it's it's so dumb uh you know they he outsmarts them he gets them all to leave and then spider-man goes okay let's let's get you and robbie and let's get out of here and as they're trying to leave to get back to earth that's when wreck rap which is parker backwards so this is essentially a bizarro spider-man um which ed mcginnis i think is a bizarro fan he did that superman batman book way back when public enemies that had bizarro in it too um yeah i mean i get i get it whatever but he's kind of a symbiote he's got a symbiote type weapon there he's got black on his hands black spider um so yeah so this demon now is wreck rap and that's where that book ends if you go out and read this i feel bad that you're gonna go out and read it um but if you do and you and you actually like dark web or like these issues that, that i didn't let me know like let me know in the comments like i'm still willing to hear other people's opinions i just don't think i'm gonna get a lot of people defending this book i looked around online somewhat and saw that this is pretty much universally hated and it's because it's one of those series where a lot of things can be wrapped up with a solid conversation which is what we've seen happen recently in like beyond which zeb wells was a writer on and he actually had that conversation and i'm sure on some level he's like okay that's when the conversation goes well but dark web is when the, when you can't have the conversation because sometimes you just can't get through to people and i'm like i maybe i understand that sure if that's your argument for this then okay i guess i can accept that that's your argument but but i guess it's different for me because it's spider-man and ben and as someone who has had who and still experiences memory stuff it just feels like such a departure for ben to act like this just because his memories were lost or tampered with but yet then how could he have the memory that peter you know kicked him off that ledge and destroyed that device like it it's it's very convenient writing on this on that level and it and it makes for a, to me a bad story so uh, if you agree with me, you know, let me know down below. If you don't agree with me, please let me know down below too. I'd love to see someone <laughs> defend this story if that's even possible. Um, but yeah, that's it for me for today. We still have uh, three or four issues left to talk about to wrap up this series. So we will do that in a couple episodes from now. Um, I'll have that to you very, very soon. And then I'm going to have a guest come on in probably like a couple weeks. And we're going to talk about this in more detail. And I, I'm going to get someone else's point of view. And I want to see if there's some stuff I missed, whatever it is, and talk it out with someone. So we're going to have a full discussion of the complete dark web. It'll probably be like a one-hour discussion, and you will definitely see that um, in the coming weeks for sure. So stay tuned if you want that as well. And then after that, I'm done with, I'm never talking about dark web again, <laughs> please. It'll be a taboo subject on here. I just, I don't want to see it. No more hashtag dark webs, nothing. Like I gotta, I want to move on from this big time. So thank you so much for watching the show as always. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And oh my God, I will, we got two more of these to make, one more to wrap up the series and then the discussion. But at least the discussion will be fun because I'll be with somebody. So I'm looking forward to that. But the next episode where I wrap this story up, I'm not because I get really mean <laughs> in that one for sure. This book ends so badly. So yeah, we'll see you then. Peace.